Yeah, one of the first things in KI is we say is that if you can't transform through, see beyond, let go of anything that you can't see, makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's a trigger happening and there's aspects that you can't see in that, what KI does is it brings it to the surface because once you can see it, then there can be a transcending, a letting go, and allowing of it. A lot of spirituality is about simply trying to feel positive and cultivate positive experiences and feelings. There's a price to pay for that. Uh, I'm telling you, there's a price to pay for it. And because we're learning now that this pushing down of the negative is actually creating disease, cancer, premature death, chronic pain. What I found most interesting about what it is you do with your treatment centers is in most cases, people are, are shamed or judged and kind of to instill like fear into the clients to keep them clean. You know, we all know that that, that track record, that, that, that idea doesn't really work very well. Your model, however, had written, you had contained a zero, zero tolerance for shaming, judging, or punishing people for whether they're using or not. You resolve the issue by using the Killaby method to heal their pain that drives the addiction in the first place. So you get to the core of the issue. Right. That's fantastic. I do want to add that your programs are not uh, limited to addiction. Um, it can be applied to any type of human suffering, anxiety, depression, relationship issues, OCD, and general unhappiness. So um, what you have to offer is something probably most of us could use, <laughs> All right? Um, so I am really curious. I mean, this is really fantastic what you're doing. Why, how did you end up down this path? Where did this start? Well, I was uh, traumatized when I was a kid from bullying and growing up gay. I ended up getting into drug and alcohol addiction to try to deal with that. I didn't know I was doing that. But that's what I was doing got clean and sober when I was 34. And I realized that then the spiritual seeking just kicked in right then. It's almost like I could see that uh, drug and alcohol was really about that. It was like trying to find myself. So I went through all, I mean, I just went through everything in the world that I could find, uh, therapies, religions, spiritual practices. And I finally found the, the non-dual message that resonated with me. I started picking up practices along those lines had experiences shifted into that non-dual recognition at some point and then just started sharing about it with no intention to be a teacher I was just like oh I want to sh- this is interesting I think people would want to know about this after a while I took a little the, the stuff that you're mentioning is probably because of what happened after that because afterwards what I noticed is that it has a big impact on addiction and mental health issues awakening and it can and so I, I thought, well, this would be interesting to explore in the mental health field. So I became addiction specialist, open treatment centers. That's where we became really trauma informed and started to understand like the unconsciousness that's driving a lot of this. And so we developed tools to really target that. So then I came back to the spiritual world now, having all those tools that we developed in that laboratory. And it's been really cool to go back to the spiritual world to help people understand more about trauma and what's driving a lot of their suffering using those tools and that information from there. And now this is just fun for me. I'm like having the time of my life helping people oh, really? with new ways, you know, of like getting to things that they couldn't. Oh, that's fantastic. So you mentioned, um, yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about this non-dual awareness. Can you tell me a little bit about that? It's a shift in perception. It's not a new belief system. It's a perceptual shift that can happen. And how that happens, we can leave that aside. But essentially, it's a shift into seeing that where you thought that there was separation in your experience, it's not there. So the energetic sense of separation and the mind's belief in that, at some point, you see through that. And it's very hard to describe that seeing, but you go from believing that you're your thoughts. That's one thing that people can relate to. I believe my thoughts. I believe that I am my thoughts. You believe that you're the body. You don't have any sense that there's an awareness under all that, that all that's appearing to. So you're identified with it. 
And so the shift is coming, recognizing that awareness at the base of everything, and then investigating where you think that there's separation, because that's where the suffering is. If the separation isn't real, then we're suffering because of an illusion. We're buying into something that isn't there. So as you start to investigate those areas of suffering, those areas of separation, you go deeper into that recognition. And so the, the deepening just continues. The recognition itself is almost impossible to describe, but it's the falling away of that sense of separation into a sense of, that's the part that's hard to, no words can really capture that. Well, is it kind of like, almost like stepping outside of yourself and trying to step outside of maybe even your emotions and yeah, it is hard to put words to. <laughs> I, I, I took a program called Landmark yes. and, and I, I feel like they, they got into that a bit um, that you, you are not um, your, your thoughts. You kind of can step outside of your thoughts and realize that you are really kind of in total control and you don't need to be run by your um, emotions and the pre-programming which has occurred in your mind. You can step outside of that, look at it and decide to make a change. Yeah, and I think it even goes deeper than that because in one way you can start to see that there is no self there. So even the one that steps out of the way. So in the, the deeper seeing, it's all appearing to no one. That's the strangest and why it's so hard to. So we really think there's a Say self. Say that again. Yeah, we really think there's a self there in the midst of all that. But what we start to discover is that there isn't actually a self in the midst of that. There's just these arisings to awareness. So thought comes up, feeling comes up, sensation comes up. But if you really took a look at that, you would see that there's no, none of those thoughts are actually you. They're actually not you. They're appearing to you. None of those feelings are actually you. There's no you. <laughs> There's just these thoughts and feelings. So the illusion is believing. Part of the illusion is believing that there's a self at the base of that, doing it all. So that's what gets seen through is that sense that there's a self there. So I, I actually do go through episodes. Well, most people go through episodes of anxiety. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've done many different programs and, and it is really quite amazing how you can through these programs, allow yourself to put these feelings at bay, the anxiety state at, at bay. Um, you know, and, and sometimes it just comes up and you know, I, I have a hard time still disconnecting from it. Um, now, what I do oftentimes when things are too bad, usually I personally connect a lot of my anxiety in my, in my chest. Um, so I know Reiki, you know, we all have this energy that flows within us and what I do is just kind of focus Reiki energy or healing energy or universal energy, whatever you want to label it as on my chest. And I can actually feel it kind of dissipate. So I'll be driving in the car. If I feel my anxiety state kind of raising, I'll, you know, kind of make a motion and feel it dissipate. I'm not in such a practiced state that anxiety does not present itself to me, unfortunately, but I know it is something that I can control. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm working on flexing that muscle. <laughs> now you had mentioned in one of your videos that you have been living as awareness since 2007. What does that mean? Um, it just means that at the base of my experience, I don't experience a separate self anymore. So that's just my way of saying it, living as awareness. So before 2007, there was a firm conviction that there's a separate self here. So after the seeing, I can't find it. That's not findable anymore. So that's the only way I say it as I'm living as awareness. That doesn't mean that I haven't had to process some things because there's an embodiment process where you have to continue looking at a few things. But for the most part, it's just been that seeing. I've just been living as that, so to speak. So that's my way of saying it. And in one of them, you had mentioned if someone is going through a really tough time, and they're not really familiar with this um, sense of like no self, right? Um, the sense of what's the right terminology? Uh, Non-dual awareness, is that correct? 
Yeah. Um, that it can actually be very traumatic for them if you don't ease them into that, um, that idea. If you just kind of throw them off a cliff and say, hey, um, it, it can be, um, it can really kind of mess them up. But by being told, by easing them into this program, by understanding this philosophy, you, it can really open up your world. And, and again, you know, I kind of hit on Landmark because I do believe that they use some of the same methods, um, at least in regards to this particular idea. And yeah, I really, it, it completely made a very different, it created a new awareness for me. And I walked away from that program uh, for, you know, a couple of weeks, just kind of removed of any crap that I felt in my body prior. Yeah, so that, that was a really cool experience. If you could tell me a little bit more about why is it, if someone's in a, um, a fragile state, if presenting this concept to them, why it could be a little bit more detrimental to them. Thank you. So there's two answers there. Hope oh, remind me to answer both, because one is the experience. Like I've met people who didn't go to any teachings. They didn't hang around a teacher. Didn't read about any of this, and they're just like walking through a hotel lobby or something, and that perceptual shift happens out of nowhere, and it scares the living daylights out of them because they have no idea what's going on. Because in that moment, it's like everything feels like an illusion. In that I moment shift so if you don't if you're not prepared for that you have no context for it It can be very scary so some of those people have to come back to the teachings to try to understand what's happening to them but the non-dual shift is arguably the most liberating and peaceful thing that any human being could experience but without context someone who's very traumatized for example someone who earlier in their life it, it was a scary situation or something happened where they are holding on to a lot of fear and sense of not being safe, for example, or any number of mental health diagnoses. If you start introducing this to them without creating a foundation and helping them process some of that stuff, then if you take them too quickly into that scene, all that stuff that they've been holding back can come to the surface too quickly and overwhelming and even can leave people in what we call like a dark night of the soul which is a, a period of time in which they're struggling with a lot of resistance. So the way that we're dealing with that in our work is a bit differently. We're helping people process some of the stuff as they learn about the non-dual message. We're also showing them about processing some of this early stuff so that they're not sent into this tailspin. Kind of easing them into it. Yeah. Makes sense. And you said there was a part two? Well, the first part was just that some people don't have any context and they just, I mentioned that first, it's like, yeah. it's important just to at least, even if you have good solid practices, to listen to some of the teachings that are providing the context, because these are the folks who've already shifted into that and they can help you kind of navigate through it. Like, oh, this is happening. What is this? And you, and you hear from someone else, like, this is what this is. Just don't be alarmed by it. You know, gotcha. Just, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to learn a little bit about a little bit more about what you offer and what programs that you have and, and what you do in those programs to help with this, you know, transformation. So a big part of this work, as I said, has turned into not just the I'll answer that question in a second, not just the transcendent where we recognize that the non-duality, it's also the processing of human stuff, because just for the reason that we said, it's because if you don't process the stuff, if you go rushing to the awakening, the stuff's gonna come up anyway, <laughs> in one way or another. So we're helping them process that. So if you understand, it's not just about the transcendent, it's about the human experience within that. That's a big part of it. The reason I say that is because we've set up this members area for that reason. So there's a members area online, which is kind of like a never ending retreat in which myself and other facilitators in this work give meetings, do videos, provide support. So that's a lot of the work is done there, frankly, at the members area. So if people are interested to learn more, go to killaby.com. You'll see a drop down menu at the top. Scroll down, Killaby members area. So 
metaphysical hands are, let's say you have a really stuck energy in the body or you feel some emotion coming up, but it feels rather stuck. And so you're told in meditation or mindfulness, just rest and let that be, be present to that. But okay. the issue is, is that there's often unconscious resistance to it. So unco- we're not aware of it. We think we're just allowing something, but we're actually unconsciously, we're either clinging to it or resisting that energy. We're identified with it. So these hands are, if you can just close your eyes for a moment, and some of you who are watching may want to do it, but at least you can hear it, is that when you find an energy in your body that feels stuck, as you just, you're looking from awareness, feeling into the body, and let's say you have like a clinch feeling in the stomach that feels stuck, you can imagine two hands, one on each side of that sensation. They're like imaginary, hence metaphysical hands. Hmm. And then as you imagine those hands on both sides, that sensation then just gets to do whatever it wants. That's the acceptance. And the hands are doing two things. One is they're helping you frame it. So for example, with these energies that are, there's a lot of resistance, it's easy for us to just bounce out of it (laughs) It, because it's painful or resistant. But with the hands there, it's like, it helps you focus on it. It helps you just center your awareness on that and rest with it. But it does something else, which is as the sensation moves, your hands move with it. So if it starts to Mm -hmm. move to the left, your hands go with it. If it starts to open, your hands open with it. Even if it starts to contract more, your hands go. So that's the magic is because at that level, these contractions, this tight energy, they don't respond to anything when we're trying to get rid of them. It tends to strengthen them because that's what it's resistance. So with these hands, you're offering no resistance. You're letting the hands move with it. So the energy has its way. And just that resistance is what can move stuck energy that's holding old emotion. So by doing that also, you know, I, I keep on referencing kind of stepping outside of trauma or yourself or whatever, but I would think by doing that, you're kind of, you're, you're, you're stepping outside of the issue and you're allowing it to dance or to move, but you can kind of, it's kind of like from the outside looking in and you can examine it um, from a very different perspective. Yes. It kind of like, you know, there, there's that exercise that, you know, how does this part of your body feel? What, if it were a color, what, what color is it? If it were a texture, what texture is it? it? It allows you to kind of analyze it from a very different perspective. There, therefore, potentially allowing you to deflate whatever issue that might be or move whatever energy that could be. Exactly. And the different perspective, you could say, is from awareness, because until we learn about what awareness is, the way that we might be processing that would be like thinking about it or doing something but from a different place would just be from observing awareness where we're just observing and allowing it from there. That first of all is a different perspective, just witnessing. So we're not adding anything to it in that moment. We're not trying to think about it. We're just resting. And then the hands add that additional acceptance because they're offering no resistance. So anything like that can be helpful where we're just looking at it from awareness, not from the mind that's trying to get rid of that or do something with it. I see. Okay. Well, that's really cool. I like that. Again, most of the tools that um, that I read, I, I don't know anything about. Are there any that you'd like to kind of hit on and talk about? Because I am very curious about, I mean, really all of them. <laughs> so the, the main one that we use is reverse inquiry. So this has been a major development because this has helped us go into much deeper stuff. Let me show it to you real quick. That'd be great. It's listening. Yes. So reverse inquiry is where, you know, you already believe something. And so you're doing something to conjure up that belief because it tends to hide. It's like an, an unconscious belief. A lot of our beliefs are just unconscious. We believe things, we operate from them and we don't see the belief. So reverse inquiry shows it to you. So if you look at, most people have a story on some level that they're not good enough. So I'll use that one as a kind of a universal story. So if you pull up your mom and dad, just see them in awareness right there, because usually these stories start there. And so the belief there is I'm not good enough. 
But to reverse it is to pull up more of that, the layers of that. So you would say the opposite of that, but not as a positive affirmation. So you would say, for example, I'm perfect as I am, but not as a, like a Stuart Smalley, you know, where he's looking at the mirror <laughs> right. that, right? But instead, it's like a thorn that you use to kind of remove the other thorns. So when you say, I'm perfect as I am, your system doesn't agree with that. So watch what happens when you say it as you're feeling into your body, looking at your parents. Hmm. See how it conjures something up. I'm perfect as I am. No. Hmm. Yeah, depending on what's coming up, you're going to start seeing thoughts and maybe memories that were otherwise unconscious. See, so you believe the story, but are you aware that like when it's triggered, are you actually aware of the programming, the stuff that makes you believe it? So what we learn is you actually not. When we're triggered, it's like wife says something and we're just upset and we're, are, we're defending or attacking, unconscious to the layers of that story from childhood. But that story is being triggered there. Right. So this tool then gets to the layers of the unconscious that you can't see in that trigger. So it'd be like pulling away from your wife. If you were just to rest as awareness, you might see some thoughts and feelings and just let them come and go, but it might not get to the real issue here, which is there's a deep sense that you feel not good enough. That's really what it's about. It isn't about the dishes or who's right about politics. It's about a deep feeling of I'm not good enough. So if you pull away from your wife and you just reverse that, looking at her and your awareness and mom and dad even and saying I'm perfect as I am here come the layers that you couldn't see the value of that is then you get to see it and see that it's not you see because before if it's unconscious you're believing it identifying with it but as you bring it up to awareness now you can see it for what it is allow it see that you're just the awareness that you know all that stuff that we say is so by triggering your triggers that brings those issues um deeper issues kind of to your awareness yeah and when they when it crosses your awareness then that's kind of like the first step to actually correcting that issue yeah the unconscious is that is that right yeah, yeah okay. one of the things first things in ki is we say is that if you can't transform through see beyond let go of anything that you can't see makes sense right mm -hmm. so if there's a trigger happening and there's aspects that you can't see in that what ki does is it brings it to the surface because once you can see it then there can be a transcending a letting go and allowing of it that makes perfect sense hmm. interesting yeah you know um you were talking about like an affirmation um affirmations themselves are great but i've heard the argument against the affirmations that you can you can say an affirmation but if you don't really feel like it's true your body is just going to be like that affirmation is not true and it, you're 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 stuck in the mud you're stuck in the sand whatever um but then there's this other thing i came across called an ask formation so um which i i think is fantastic it's not saying um you know i am let's say the affirmation is um i'm loved by many but you truly don't believe that right and you really can't get past that but an ask formation is why am I loved by many? And if you ask yourself a question, your brain's going to search, regardless of what the question is, your brain's going to search for the answer. So it's like, well, why, why am I loved by many? Well, and your brain comes up with an answer. So I think that's kind of an interesting workaround for an affirmation that, you know, you're kind of button heads with. Yeah, but in your case, in your case, what you're, you're actually bringing up affirmations to find those triggers and once you find those triggers you then are now aware of those issues to then collapse them yeah so that's very cool yeah the other thing about affirmations is i like what you're saying anything we'll get around that because with what we've noticed with this work we deal a lot with repression so that's another because this is an embodiment path too so from an early age we're holding back certain emotions to stay safe and in the awakening process, generally that stuff comes to the surface, which for a deeper freedom, because how freeing would it be if we're just still holding on and holding back with basic human emotions? So that gets unearthed in the embodiment process. Um, but the key there, these affirmations, is if you already understand that being human means holding back certain negative emotions, which if you brought them forward would be healing, 
That's the other thing. So this is what we're finding. You actually can heal physical pain, chronic pain, by rediscovering the anger that you bury. So all that, so that might be counterintuitive. And this is why people aren't healing because they don't want to go to these areas, but right. you can actually heal that way. Um, the positive affirmations sometimes have a way of further suffering down the negative stuff. In non-duality, it's negative and positive fully allowed. It's not cultivating only positive things and pushing down negative things. So if you're repressing emotion and you're trying to say a positive affirmation, you could be further stuffing that emotion down in your body, mm. which can lead to illness and chronic pain. So here we don't like affirmations because they tend to help us run from what we're already running from. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, before we start to wrap things up, is there anything that you wanted to hit on that you think is, you know, there's a lot of chaos in the world right now um, that's timely that you, you know, any messages that you want to kind of convey? You know, it is a tough time. And for some reason, this is what's coming up as I look at spirituality. A lot of spirituality is about simply trying to feel positive and cultivate positive experiences and feelings. There's a price to pay for that. Uh, I'm telling you, there's a price to pay for it. And because we're learning now that this pushing down of the negative is actually creating disease, cancer, premature death, chronic pain. So if you're on a spiritual path, be careful. That's all I'm saying. Be careful with this whole idea that the idea is just to cultivate, to get rid of the negative and cultivate positive, because whatever you're doing, uh, that you could be setting yourself up for more problems. So maybe there's something that someone hears today where they don't come to the non-dual path, but at least they hear that and they hear that that could be actually detrimental to my health, to be trying to use spirituality to avoid human experience. And that's mm. the message is like, that doesn't work. And that's actually leading to illness now. And that's really my message these days is it's a truly non-dual message would be, you're going to have to welcome all of that. You're kind of talking about uh, um, like shadow work. I mean, really it's, it's yeah. that, that's when you dive in deep. Right. Yeah. And that, that's tough to face. Right. Right. So um, to, to really claim who you are, to really dive in, you, you got to face your shadows and that's when you can really make some big change. Um, yeah. But like you were saying, it's not as quite as superficial as, uh, Oh, I'm spiritual. I'm going to push down the uh, bad and open up to the good. It, it doesn't quite work like that. You almost have to dive into the bad so that you can come out the other end for the better. What's interesting is the shadows are actually one of the ways that are bringing the deeper embodiment in this work, because those shadows are, tend to be pointing to obviously something in ourselves that we don't. So uh, the more we access that, there's, there's more freedom. So even though it's scary, <clears throat> that's the path. That's the actual way in the scary stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I interviewed, I guess a week, well, a couple of weeks ago, um, a chiropractor. Um, and he basically does everything energetically. And he has this, is, he has a book. It has something like uh, pain is the portal to freedom something along those lines. He's right. like the pain that that is the portal. That's where you want to go. That's how you make it out on the other end, like, and blossom. Right. That's, the soul. that's what we're running from our whole life. So it makes sense that the healing and the awakening comes from turning towards exactly what we're running from, but it's so hard for us to get that. Like, yes. we're so thick, you know, thick headed around it, but eventually I think that's what it shows us on the path that the answer is, in the thing that's driving the seeking. So do you know Ken Wilber? Are you aware of his work? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, he's considered like the Einstein of consciousness. He's like one of the living great philosophers. Okay. And he has developed a shadow process that he gave me permission to use. Oh, wow. I think the best process just for shadows. So let me just send it to you. Okay. Because I really do think this is another doorway to freedom and, and there's a lot of resistance to it. But just understanding that the basic idea is if there's something too painful, or too scary, or too beautiful within me, it's natural to not want to. That's just natural. But then what happens is, is that whatever I disown in myself, I tend to become fixated on in other people. So if I feel like if I can't deal with the thought that I'm greedy, for example, 
I'll shut it out. <clears throat> Suddenly now greedy people are a trigger. And then I might get busy just trying to witness those thoughts or the usual meditation practices or whatever, but it doesn't work very well with shadows because it's, it's like somebody else's problem, not mine. I don't have it. So the shadow process brings it fully back to your side. Like I am greedy so that you can feel and allow all those emotions that you didn't want to feel with that. And then by allowing all that and just seeing it for what it is, then the shadow goes away, but it's not like you're left with the story. I'm greedy. You go deeper than that. You feel the fear under that. You can let go of that too, but you can't let go of it. If you're shadowing it onto someone else, it's hard because it doesn't even look like your issue. So the shadow is different. Say that again. You can't go into that. If you're, Hard to let go of a shadow because it does. It, you're making it seem like it's not your issue. We are. So if it's shadowed out, it looks like he's greedy. So it doesn't look like your issue. So that's why people have difficulty with shadows because as you start to witness it, it still seems like this isn't a viewpoint that this is not me. It's him. Mm. And so you right. have to kind of see that it is you first, that you have that in you, and then you can let go of that. But that's the tricky thing with shadows. People try to let go of shadows before they own them. And it doesn't mm. work. Well. They still continue to see the shadow because they haven't owned it yet. It's a strange little thing in there. I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's that definitely something I need to dive into. And maybe I don't want to, but I need to. <laughs> um, definitely but it is, it's a practice that I'm hearing more and more about. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's good stuff. And then we're, we're linking it to repression, as I was saying. So as we find these shadows, we find that, these shadows are how we keep down certain feelings that we don't want to feel. So if greedy comes with certain feelings that I don't want to feel, those can come to the surface. And when those feelings of, that we're repressing come to the surface, there's a real deep freedom there um, because of holding all that in, oh. pretending like we don't have it, and then shadowing it out. All that energy behind that is in the body around the shadow. So that's where we're linking it now, is taking people down into that. Wow. And it is scary, but it's incredibly liberating too. Well, this has been really fantastic. Um, I, I really appreciate your time and, yeah. and everything that you do. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. I appreciate it. <laughs>